Welcome everyone to UC Berkeley's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute's Fall Speaker Series. I'm Susan Hoffman, the director. Today we will hear from Dr. Michael Baker. Please add your comments and questions in the chat or um, I don't think we'll have ch a chance for you to raise your hand, but add those questions in the chat. As always in the coming week, you will be able to find Dr. Baker's talk on Ollie's YouTube website after it has been captioned. Dr. Michael Baker is a semi-retired general and trauma surgeon who served his country in uniform for 30 years. In his role as a Navy officer, he had experience in operational medicine, combat deployments, medical intelligence, and strategic planning. He retired with the rank of Rear Admiral. Today, Dr. Baker will provide his account of his humanitarian visit to Ukraine's capital city of Kyiv, where he taught advanced trauma life support to Ukrainian physicians on behalf of the International Medical Corps, an NGO focused on humanitarian activities. One final note, Dr. Baker has taught with Ali multiple times in the past several years including a course entitled The Use and Misuse of the American Military. And he will return in the upcoming winter term with a new course. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for being here and for all that you've done for Ali and the world. And we look forward to your talk now. Thank you, Susan, for that uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, and thank you all for joining me this morning. We, we live in perilous times. And you know, sometimes you, you have to run towards the peril rather than away from it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about teaching casualty care in Ukraine. Uh, I entitled this, Helping the Ukrainians Defend Themselves in Their Homeland. Uh, those of you who sat in on my lecture about the Ukraine conflict earlier this year, you'll see a couple of familiar slides because I need to review some of the history, some of the geography and some of the politics you know, before we get to why I was there and what I was doing. Uh, but I think it's all important, and you'll see how it all comes together, uh, including what I call kind of a little side hustle adventure while I was in Ukraine. So why is a retired general surgeon traveling to Ukraine during a war? What am I doing? Well, as Susan mentioned, I had this second parallel career. You know, I decided after I did all my training and my fellowships and everything uh, that I would put on a uniform. I got sworn in and commissioned to the Navy put on a uniform with uh, two stripes. This is my first promotion photo to two and a half stripes, no color on my uniform at this point. But you know, as those of you who know me, I retired after 30 years in uniform with a bit more color on my uniform and a lot of tremendous experiences and the opportunity not only to participate in a lot of events, but to meet absolutely incredible people, a few of whom you're gonna meet today. A um, couple disclaimers about the talk, as always, the talk is graphic. It's open source material. I can back it up. My statements are my own opinions. They don't reflect the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, the Marine Corps, OLLI programs. Uh, I have nothing monetary to declare, no conflict of interest. I don't do politics really much, and I will try not to swear like a sailor, although this particular topic gets me pretty riled up, as you'll see. And I want to remind you, I'm not an expert. Uh, in the words of one of my friends, Malcolm Nance, who you're going to see later in the show, uh, what I try to do is look at all the facts, try and corroborate what I see, and, and draw dots between them so that I can uh, put things together in a way that we can all understand. Um, but I'm not an expert. And I'm also, as this doctor says, I'm a doctor, not an historian. A doctor, not a historian. Uh, I'm not a politician. Um, but I do have a little extra knowledge of the military and strategy and policy that maybe I can bring to bear to help this discussion today. So if we were doing a social science class, what causes friction between groups? Boundary disputes are very commonly part of it. Resource competition. You know, wars have been fought over oil. Pretty soon they're going to be fought over water, maybe food. Uh, ethnic strife. We see this everywhere. Uh, right now, I believe there are 26 armed conflicts going on around the globe, which is just a staggering number for those of us who live in peace and don't have to be disrupted by this. And the last one I'm gonna throw into this that wasn't really in the social science class is when you have a successful democracy next door to an authoritarian regime, 
you've got to you got to wonder how long that's going to last because you know that's oil and water next to each other and we'll talk a lot about that and very often if a war starts one party is one of those totalitarian or authoritarian regimes that thinks they're going to win we're going to do this blitzkrieg and it's going to be over real quick and we're going to win the confidence rate of success is very high so europe has been at peace for 75 years what happened here how did this happen well, I like to joke that Mark Twain said God created war so that Americans would learn geography. And, and you're all figuring out Central Europe a lot better than you used to. And I've gotten a real inside glance. Uh, historically, Ukraine has been part of many countries. If you look at the 1619 map that I'm showing you here, where it was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, it included Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, all in one big country under one ruler. It's shifted many times, as we'll see in a couple of different maps. U Ukraine was immense at this time, part of a big commonwealth. So one of the facts of the war is this claim that Ukraine is part of Russia, and the Ukrainians are really Russians. So is Ukraine part of Russia? And are the Ukrainians really Russians? Well, depending on when you look at those maps historically, um, you've got the central part of Ukraine in 1654, in this blue and yellow areas and areas that were added by Stalin over here on the left in 1939, by Lenin in 1922, down here by Khrushchev in 1954. Um, and this is essentially the country that we saw prior to the invasion of 2014. The borders have shifted many times. Um, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe by land mass. Before the war, there were 44 million people. It was a breadbasket for the entire world. I've got some variable numbers on who they feed. Uh, and that map before Russia invaded, you know, looked like this. You know, it, it extended uh, from Lvov over here near the Polish border on the left, all the way over to uh, a city that none of us ever heard of before called Mariupol and uh, to Odessa down here in the south, uh, a very big, broad country with an incredible mix of industry and agriculture. Um, and it's just, we got to go back to that question. Is Ukraine historically part of Russia or is it a separate country with a separate language? This is really important. At the end of the Soviet expansionism, uh, before the USSR collapsed, this is what uh, the Soviet bloc looked like. The big red spot in the middle, of course, is sort of mainland Russia. Uh, over here, number six in, in yellow is Ukraine and some of these other countries with numbers on them, you know, actually spun out of the uh, Soviet bloc when it collapsed, as we'll talk about. But this was an immense bloc called the Warsaw Pact at that time. But 1991, the USSR imploded. Uh, many of those satellite states decided on independence. The Ukrainians voted for independence, and they had an act that established Ukraine's independence. Um, I can't pronounce the way it's up there, but in the Translation is the Act of Declaration of Independence of Ukraine. Uh, it was very strongly supported by the Ukrainian people. They had 90% voting in favor with 84% of the electorate participating. Uh, I wish we could get that many people out to vote in this country. Um, and the newly elected Ukrainian president signed accords with the Russians and the Belarusians to state that the Soviet Union no longer existed, that Ukraine was independent. And several years later, the map looks like this. All these countries have spun off. The Russian Federation is up here at the top at, uh, in purple. Uh, Ukraine is here kind of in green, where I just put the star on your map, uh, surrounded by Poland, Belarus, Czechoslovakia, and other independent states over here, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, some of these now in the news in their own right for various reasons. Um, in 1994, there was further efforts to secure Ukraine's sovereignty and stability with the Budapest Memorandum. The US, Russia, and Britain committed to Ukraine to respect the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine's borders. Interesting statement. Uh, and to refrain from the threat or use of force. But of course, Putin did it anyway. Uh, Boris Yeltsin at that time was the leader of Russia, said there would be no revision of those boundaries that had emerged from the Soviet collapse. This is it, this is Ukraine, this is your border. We know how long that lasted. Um, interestingly, even, it even made it to Russian news. Hello, I'm Yanash Ravinsky, and you're watching TDP World. 
On the 5th of December 1994, the United States, Russia and Britain committed to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine and to refrain from the threat of use of force against the country. Those assurances played a key role in persuading the Ukrainian government in Kyiv to give up what amounted to the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. Interesting. Um, so why does Ukraine matter to the rest of the world? You know, most people in the United States had never given it a thought uh, before February 24th. Most people in the world didn't think too much about it. But it's sort of just like you go to business school, it's location, 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 and it's resources in this case adds a lot. Um, many of the gas pipelines that Europe was dependent upon run right through Ukraine, which is here in the center of your uh, map in yellowish with the pipelines crossing through here into Europe, uh, providing 36% of Germany's consumption, 23% of France's consumption, 27% of Italy's consumption of gas. So oil and gas coming from Russia through Ukraine were huge. Uh, and of course they play a key role now in what's going on with leverage. Uh, it's a very industrialized country. Uh, they're the first in Europe in ammonia production which is important for both fertilizer and explosives and some other things. Um, they had some pretty big power plants that were very effective, although now we know these are at risk. Uh, they're the third largest iron exporter in the world, which is interesting. And they had a big steel and iron industry to go with it. Uh, they're the, talked about the pipelines. Uh, other resources, they've got the largest recoverable reserves of uranium ore. They've got titanium ore. Uh, the, they're the second in the world's reserves of manganese ores. Um, all this stuff is important now. And uh, uh, because, you know, we need all of these kinds of elements to do the kinds of industry that we do today. So when you look at a map of all the resources, this is a little bit busy for all of you. Um, but the fact of the matter is you can see that there's natural resources all over everything from titanium to coal to iron. Uh, lots of iron and things in the Donetsk and Luhansk region, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, there are, are areas of crude oil and gas up here in Kharkiv and Poltava. So, but the other thing is, this is a very agriculturally ri rich country. Ukraine was previously able to meet the needs, at least when I first read about this, of 600 million people. We'll see later in a little video, they uh, have a slightly lower number, but they fed a lot of people. And if you look at the map, that I took off the CIS, CSIS website, um, Ukrainian agricultural exports uh, went to China, went to India, went to Turkey, to Egypt, to Italy. Uh, they supported many, many, many millions of people uh, with corn and sunflower oil and wheat and all kinds of agricultural products, which of course are now bottled up in uh, the ports of Odessa. And of course, nothing's coming out of Mariupol because the Russians destroyed it and now occupy their victory. Um, let's take a look at that for a sec. This is from... Russia's invasion and its blockade of Ukrainian ports are preventing Ukraine from exporting its grain and steel. Odessa is Ukraine's largest port and so far has avoided a direct Russian assault. But Russian ships in the Black Sea have created a blockade. Ukraine's one of the largest exporters of wheat, corn and oil. But Europe's breadbasket today is scarred. Ukraine and the U.S. accuse Russia of targeting agricultural infrastructure, including silos and the railroad bridges Ukraine needs to export. Russia's even fired at farmers and tractors. And Ukraine says what Russia doesn't target, it steals. Trucks with hundreds of thousands of tons of Ukrainian grain have been moved to Russian-occupied territory. Food supply for millions of Ukrainians and millions more around the world has quite literally been held hostage by the Russian military. This war is having effects on global markets, global supplies, and, and prices again around the world. Caitlin Welsh is the director of the Global Food Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She says the war exacerbated already record high global food prices and will limit food availability in the very countries that need it most. The countries that are net food importing countries that, that, uh, that consume high amounts of wheat and that rely on the Black Sea for, for imports of wheat are particularly affected. Um, and even if the war were to end today, it would take a significant amount of time and investment to bring Ukraine to its pre-war levels of agricultural productivity. 
So Ukrainian flag, blue sky over green wheat fields. Um, turns out Ukraine is central to the world's global food sources as well as industry and natural gas and oil. So why did Putin attack Ukraine? We're gonna go into this a little more. We've talked about it before. He says Ukraine's always been part of Russia. Ukrainians are actually Russians. Ukraine is controlled by a small clique of Nazis. NATO is getting too close and threatens Russia. Ukraine might someday join NATO. Um, but we already looked at the fact that Ukraine has been part of many countries and empires and borders have changed often. I'm gonna introduce you again to historian Yuval Harari, uh, who I think is one of the smartest guys I've ever heard give a TED talk. The most crucial thing to know is that Ukrainians are not Russians <clears throat> and that Ukraine is an ancient independent nation. Ukraine has a history of more than a thousand years. Kyiv was a major metropolis and cultural center when Moscow was not even a village. Uh, for centuries, Kyiv was looking westwards and was a part of a union with Lithuania and Poland until it was eventually conquered and absorbed by the Russian Empire, by the Tsarist Empire. But even after that, Ukrainians remained a separate people. The key issue of the war, at least for President Putin, is whether Ukraine is an independent nation, whether it is a nation at all. He has this fantasy that um, Ukraine isn't a nation, that Ukraine is just a part of Russia, that Ukrainians are Russians. In his fantasy, um, Ukrainians are Russians that want to be back in the fold of Mother Russia. His belief was, at least, that he just needs to uh, uh, invade. Zelensky will flee, uh, the government will collapse, the army would lay down its arms, and the Ukrainian people would welcome uh, the Russian liberators throwing flowers on them. Actually, they were throwing... Uh missiles and Molotov cocktails on them, not quite what he expected. And uh, Ukrainians held up amazingly. So why did Russia invade Ukraine? I think part of it was to erase the humiliation of the Soviet collapse. We'll talk about that again. They wanted to regain control of that separatist republic and their resources. Putin wants to be a relevant force on the world stage because you know, he's running a second rate country with a lot of problems. and wants to restore the glory of the Russian Empire. He sees himself as like another czar. Uh, and there's more to it. He wants to disrupt and weaken perceived enemies. And under a prior US administration, NATO was cracking apart and falling apart and looked like it might have been uh, uh, the end of NATO. But most important, the real reason I think Putin wants to crush Ukrainian democracy has to do with, as this ambassador, former ambassador from the US says, he can't afford to have a democracy next door. Vladimir Putin's objective is to keep Ukraine, the second largest country on the continent, from making common cause with the democracies of Europe. What motivates Putin is a concern about the independence of Ukraine, a worry that a, a functioning, successful, prosperous democracy in Ukraine. A functioning, successful, prosperous, prosperous democracy in Ukraine would be a problem. Poses a direct threat to his rule because it will give people in Russia the idea that they too could enjoy what Ukraine uh, enjoys and rise up against his autocratic rule. So the idea that Ukraine and NATO threatens Russia is also bogus. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so back to Putin's reasons for attacking Ukraine. Ukraine has always been part of Russia. I think we've seen that's really not true. Ukrainians are actually Russians. No, they have a separate history, separate culture, separate language. Ukraine is controlled by a small clique of Nazis. I can dismiss that as a fantasy. You know, it's just nuts. Uh, NATO is getting too close and threatens Russia. We have to talk about this one, that NATO, NATO, NATO. NATO is getting too close. When you look at this map, the older members of NATO are in the darker blue purple color. And you can see them here, you know, France, Germany, Great Britain. Uh, the newer countries, the ones that spun off from the Warsaw Pact, like up here, the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, um, and some of these other countries, uh, such as Poland and Czechoslovakia, you know, they wanted to join NATO, uh, Montenegro, Romania. I mean, it's just amazing. They, they want to be in NATO. Um, so when you look at the map, and, and here's Ukraine, 
And he's saying, well, this threatens Russia because it's too close. I, I don't know what that really means because these countries here uh, also border Russia. And, and I don't think it matters whether your missile is launched from uh, you know, site number five over here or from site number one over here if you were going to war. But you know, you got to remember NATO is a defensive organization. So this is a bogus claim. And you've got these Baltic states right up against Russia already on the border of Russia. And down here, you've got Turkey and some of these other areas that are pretty close to Russia on the southern part of the European Russian border. So it's it's just kind of a, it's just one of those things he throws up, hopes it sticks to the wall. Uh, but I want to point out to you where this red arrow just appeared, and I'll do it again for you. That little gray spot is called Kaliningrad. It will be very important to our discussion in a minute because Kaliningrad is a Russian naval base controlled by Russia that is located in here between the Baltics and uh, Poland. And there's a land bridge across here to keep their naval base supplied. And they have nuclear weapons. So this business about you're too close to Russia, the fact is Russia is right in the middle of NATO. Um, and one of the things that was accomplished by this war was that the previously neutral Finland and Sweden rushed to join NATO. They want to be part of the self-defense. So you can see Ukraine down here. You can see the countries of NATO. And you can see that now we've got added Sweden. We've added Finland. Guess what? Now you have another 800 miles of border along Russia. That is part of NATO and part of NATO's self-defense uh, grouping. Uh, an attack on one is an attack on all, according to NATO, um, you know, charter item number five. So this conflict sort of started incrementally. And it started when Putin made a statement that the fall of the Soviet empire was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Wow, I thought World War I was pretty bad and the flu epidemic and the depression and World War II. Uh, but no, the fall of the Soviet empire, <clears throat> he thinks, was the greatest catastrophe. So you already see where his mind is at. Um, and this little event kind of creeped up on us incrementally, like the frog in the pot of boiling water heating up slowly, right? Um, you know, it starts off with 2008, he invades Georgia. By the way, this fall of the Soviet empire is stated in 2007. 2008, he invades Georgia. The West doesn't really do anything. 2014, they invade Crimea. The West doesn't really do anything. And when the West doesn't react, as we'll see, and I'm going to have somebody who is more of an expert talk to you about what happens, uh, like in Munich in 1938, when you don't oppose a dictator. Um, so Gary Kasparov, you may remember him as a chess grandmaster from Russia, became an anti-Russian activist, anti-Putin activist, I should say. I saw evil because I heard evil. Putin was telling us what he was. All we had to do was listen. When Putin said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, I knew Russia's newly independent neighbors were at risk. And when Putin talked at Munich Security Conference in 2007 about a return to spheres of influence, I knew he was ready to launch his plan. It was the language from Molotov Ribbentrop Pact 1939, the language Hitler and Stalin used to divide Europe. And a year later, in 2008, Putin invaded the Republic of Georgia, 2014, Ukraine. It's a paradox, isn't it? Dictators lie about everything they have done. But often they tell us exactly what they're going to do. Just listen. Anyone who is surprised at Putin's war crimes in Ukraine must not be aware about his uh, long record, beginning with the Second Chechen War in Grozny more than two decades ago. Vladimir Putin has been a war criminal from the start. It is policy. We'll talk about that. So what's the legacy of Vladimir Putin now because of this? Well, here's what he started. It's a war, stupid, not a special military operation. 
Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении 8 лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. Кто бы не пытался помешать нам, а тем более создать угрозы для нашей страны, для нашей really we'll страны, народа должны знать, что ответ России будет незамедлительным и приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы в своей истории еще никогда не сталкивались. He's a threat to global peace and security, and right there, he's, that's the first time he makes kind of that nuclear threat, very subtle. Мы готовы к любому развитию событий. And I am tempted to reply to him, quoting the Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island who were responding to the Moskva before it got sunk. Uh, you may remember their response when the Moskva told them to surrender. We know how that turned out for the Moskva. Amazing. So Putin launches his special military operation thinks it will be easy. We saw that earlier in our social science review. But what does Yuval Harari say about that? His long-term goal, the whole rationale of the war, is to deny the existence of the Ukrainian nation and to absorb it into Russia. And to do that, it's not enough to conquer Ukraine. You also need to hold it. And it's all based on this fantasy, on this gamble, that most of the population in Ukraine would agree to this, would even welcome this. And we already know that it's not true, that the Ukrainians are a very real nation. They are fiercely independent. They don't want to be part of Russia. They will fight like hell. And we've sure seen evidence of their resolve. So what happens if Putin's successful? I mean, what if he had done this so quickly? Well, the next stop, I mentioned Kaliningrad, we're going to talk about that, maybe followed by Moldova, after that, maybe Lithuania. But if you look at the map here, you know, Russia on the right, uh, Lithuania is here. This is Kaliningrad, where this arrow just appeared. This is a Russian naval base, and he needs a land bridge through Lithuania to Kaliningrad, to the Navy base. And this is a map of the current uh, areas of fighting. And over here, I want to show this arrow is going to appear. This is Moldova. Russian troops have occupied this little orange strip in Moldova since the 1990s. It's kind of an odd thing. It's under Russian control uh, because of some pro-Russian separatists that did that same kind of thing that they did over here in Donbass uh, to get the Russians in there earlier. So. These are areas that are high risk. Had his first invasion been successful, they would have rolled right into Kaliningrad and Moldova. So what has he really achieved so far? Well, depending on who you read, somewhere between the 14,200 estimated by the UN, there may be as many as 100,000 Ukrainians killed, uh, at least 9,000 Ukrainian military dead per the chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, which is what I heard a week or two ago. Uh, 13 million Ukrainians have been displaced, either internally displaced from their homes or externally into foreign countries. We'll talk more about that as well. Uh, there are refugees all across Europe who amazingly have been welcomed into people's homes everywhere. I was so, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Poland if we can. I, I'm very impressed with them. Um, more than a million and a half and maybe as many as three million uh, Ukrainians have been kidnapped into Russia and taken to something called filtration camps or concentration camps where their kids are put in school to learn Russian. Uh, and who knows what happens to some of the parents. So, you know, they're kidnapping people. What kind of war crime is that? Um, and this is the other part of his legacy. I mean, literally, literally tens of thousands of dead. And, and these are not all fighters. A lot of these are civilians, they're older people, they're kids. Uh, it, it's a tremendous tragedy big swaths of this country have been destroyed. So his achievements, he's also probably gotten 25,000 Russian soldiers killed based on the estimates by uh, NATO and British intelligence, maybe 75,000 wounded. Uh, that's half the force that he used to invade Ukraine back February 24th. To lose 50% of your fighting force means your army is ineffective. Um, they may have lost between 3,000 and 4,000 armored vehicles, according to our Undersecretary of Defense. Again, this is estimates from satellite data and intelligence. 
Um, but on the downside, 130,000 Ukrainian buildings have been destroyed by rockets and artillery. That, that's an enormous number. Um, so this is his legacy. Lots of death, lots of destruction. Um, you know, apartment buildings are not military tactical targets. Neither are dams, power stations, schools, or hospitals. I mean, my time in Ukraine really, you know, I kind of knew it, but it's different to see it. So what has Putin really achieved? Well, he's alarmed the entire world. He's united Western allied nations, EU and NATO and the US are standing tall. Uh, he sort of galvanized the United Nations into what I'd call slight action. Uh, but I think until they remove Russia from the Security Council and take away their veto, they'll never be able to do anything in this conflict. Um, they're demonstrating why we all need to oppose authoritarians everywhere. And, and we'll come back to this topic. Uh, there's a reason. Um, why did I go into the conflict zone? And that has a lot to do with this is it is a genocide against the Ukrainians. You do have to contribute wherever you think you have the ability to contribute. Uh, and I think it's going to affect all of us, which is really what I want to bring home to you today. Democracy under attack anywhere is an attack on democracy everywhere. Um, the Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland. Russia's invasion had absolutely no basis in fact or truth. Uh, there was no genocide in the East. Uh, the, the Ukrainians are not Russians. It's not run by Nazis. NATO is not going to attack Russia. Um, and I have American and European friends fighting in combat over there who you're going to meet uh, a little bit here. Um, and I was asked to teach casualty care. It was a humanitarian ask by the IMC. Um, and, you know, that's something I can do. I'm not going to pick up a gun. I'm, I'm getting a little uh, older and slower for something like that, but I'm pretty happy Take, teaching people how to take care of casualties. And I could still do that. So in August, I traveled to Ukraine to teach ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. It, it's a very, very formal course. It was sponsored by the International Medical Corps and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And they train medical providers to manage acute injuries, as we'll talk about. And it's sponsored and run uh, by the American College of Surgeons, of which I'm a member. It's taught in 81 countries, and it has to be taught exactly to their constraints. It has to be done exactly the way they want you to do it. Um, otherwise, they won't certify you to do it. This is the first time it's ever been taught in Ukraine. They're very interested. Um, it provides uh, a, a really good foundation for caring for injured patients. It teaches a common language and it's a common approach. And you go through a primary survey that involves airway and breathing and ventilation, circulation with bleeding control, disability, exposure. And then you do life-saving interventions at each step as needed. So I'm not gonna give you the course, but we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Getting there was pretty interesting. I took a flight from SFO actually to LA waited four hours, got on a flight to Warsaw, which was 12 hours. So that was about 18 hours by plane to get to Warsaw. If you look at the map, you know, roughly speaking, I drew a line here kind of over Greenland. That's, that's, that's how you fly this route. Uh, people keep trying to explain to me why the shortest route is a curved line over the globe. Uh, and, and I sort of get it. Um, but this was, a, this was a long trip and a long way to get to Warsaw. When I got to Warsaw, I went to this town by plane, which I will ask all of you, how do you pronounce this? They, they have a problem with vowels. Uh, it's actually pronounced Zezau. Zezau is down near the border. So we've then caught a connection to Zezau. Um, as you can see here on the map, Warsaw to Zezau is about an hour by airplane, gets us down close to the border with Ukraine. Uh, you can see it's right across from Lviv. And you know there are opportunities to jump on the train in Lviv, but that wasn't going to be our way of getting there. So we went by van to the border, which took about 90 minutes. Uh, then we walked across and through immigration, which took another 60 minutes or so. And we met another van on the other side, on the Ukrainian side. Why was it done this way? It was done because there's a backup of trucks and traffic that's probably eight or 12 hours long. And we didn't want to sit in that traffic for eight or 12 hours waiting to get through uh, the gate into Ukraine where they inspect everything. So Roughly speaking, you know, from Zhezhou to Kiev, uh, this is the line we took, but we didn't take a straight line. Um, you know, it looks like a straight line, 
but we took side roads. So all these little roads in white are probably the roads we were on because you know you don't want to be with the convoys on the main roads because you become an artillery target. So we took side roads in our van. It was a lovely eight hour trip through the countryside of Ukraine. I got to see a lot of Ukraine. And actually uh, the part that has not been affected by war is amazingly beautiful. It's a place you'd want to visit. Um, and it sort of felt safe, you know, but clearly it was a country at war. There were air raid sirens, there were bomb shelters, there were checkpoints, there were fighting posts, there were armed guards in lots of places. Um, so as we're driving down one of these roads, you can see that there's bar barricades here as well as uh, checkpoints uh, in the city itself. Uh, there's these three-sided barricades that function both as fighting points and as uh, quick bomb shelters if you need to get off the street. Um, so sightseeing really took on a new meaning. You know, you could be driving down the road and come to one of these barricades, you know, where you have to get out of the van, inspect your van, make sure you're not a bad guy. Uh, you can see here through the windshield what this looks like. Uh, I had to take a quick picture because they don't like you taking pictures of their stuff. It's an operational security thing. Um, when I got to Kiev, I immediately uh, went out to take a look at some of what was going on around town because, you know, the Russians were stopped 20 kilometer, kilometers north of Kiev. And this is uh, some Russian armor in front of St. Michael's Cathedral, uh, which also I had to visit since, you know, we share a name. Uh, but, you know, this was kind of an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, and also a lot of their monuments and statues and things have been sandbagged to protect them from artillery and missiles to, to try and retain some of the beauty of Kiev, which really is a very beautiful city. So what's it like? So I'm going to borrow from uh, Fareed Zakaria. He just had a little video that's better than mine uh, about traffic and life in Kiev. Traffic was moving, shops were open, and restaurants were full. You could buy French wines, American energy drinks, and candy from around the world at the local grocery store. They are determined to carry on. Air raid sirens sounded off once or twice a day, but people paid little attention to them. Kiev is now well removed from the fighting. Ukrainians seem determined to show that life will go on, that the Russian invasion has not brought their lives to a halt. So I was a little bit surprised, you know, that okay to eat in restaurants, out on the sidewalk, have a cup of coffee, go to the museum, the opera was open, um, the ballet was having a performance. They were encouraging people to live their lives, but be prepared to go to the shelters. So I wanna show you a little bit about their schools. We're gonna talk more about their schools because this has a lot to do with Ukraine. Schools in Ukraine have been shut since the Russian invasion in February. Thousands of them shelled and battered by Russian bullets, bombs, and rockets. But on the first of this month, they opened again to millions of students. Air raid sirens still sometimes punctuate the day in Kyiv. When the children go out to play, they have to bring so-called safety bags with them. These are filled with food and water and books and toys what they need for time spent in the school's air raid shelter. In fact, no school in Ukraine was allowed to open for in-person classes without a shelter. Uh, I don't want to live in this war circumstances where uh, I just, I want to study. And uh, it's just, it's really painful. I just want to uh, develop my knowledge. I want to meet with my friends, but I need to go to shelter. 13 years old. Um... Pretty amazing. The whole generation's going to be scarred a little bit. But we got down to business after a day and started teaching advanced trauma life support. Trains medical providers to manage acute injuries. So you're there, as I mentioned, it's sponsored and accredited by the American College of Surgeons. It was introduced in 1980. I've been an instructor almost since it started. Uh, it's taught to more than a million doctors in more than 80 countries. And as I, I think 81 was the last uh, that I saw, it's focused on the first providers on the scene. It gives you a foundation. How do you care for this injury that might be complex? Well, we teach a common language and we teach a standard approach for care in what at one time was referred to as the golden hour. It still somewhat applies, but there's certain things you need to do if you want people to survive. And, you know, that primary survey that I showed you earlier, you know, we talk about airway maintenance, and you're going to think this is simplistic, but we do A, B, C, D, E. 
airway, airway maintenance, always first, unless there's active bleeding. Breathing and ventilation. If they're not ventilating well, what can you do to, to maintain them? Uh, C is circulation and bleeding control. Active bleeding, put on a pressure dressing, put on a tourniquet. We taught everybody how to use tourniquets. We brought the latest and greatest, fanciest ones with us to Ukraine and gave them out uh, to all kinds of providers. Um, we teach D, which is disability and neurologic assessment. Don't move people with C-spine injuries or things like that. Um, you know, make sure you splint fractures. Uh, exposure and environmental control. You know, if they're out in the weather, maybe you're a soldier on the battlefield, don't cut the guy's uniform away like we do in the emergency room here uh, because he needs that uniform to stay warm. So, you know, we try to teach that you can keep people warm or, you know, safe from the environment without removing all their clothes to get to the wounds. Um, and then at each step, as you do your ABC, when you identify a life-saving intervention at each step, you, you tackle it and you take care of it. And then we teach our students to go back and do their ABCs all over again. Make sure nothing changed with the airway. Make sure the ventilation is still adequate. Make sure your pressure dressing is still controlling the bleeding. So it's a really, it's a standard way to do things with a common language that anybody can learn to do. There's also a pre-hospital version that we had another group that was teaching to uh, the paramedics, the EMTs, to the school nurses, to the staff at nursing homes, to other people who wouldn't normally have to deal with trauma during their medical professional careers. But we wanted them to have a level of this knowledge as well. Um, so we had didactic lectures. We do two or three didactic lectures, uh, followed by hands-on skill stations. You can see my interpreter here. Uh, he, he does simultaneous interpretation. The slides were interpreted the night before uh, into Ukrainian. Um, I'm looking at the English version, and, and he's helping me with questions from the audience as well as going over it. The interpreters were fabulous. After we do that, we have skill stations with mannequins. Again, I have an interpreter there to help me. Uh, we, we demonstrate the hands-on techniques that we think everybody should know, whether it's securing an airway or putting on a tourniquet on the mannequins. Um, these are fairly high-tech and fairly impressive mannequins, and uh, it, it really helps them get a feel for what they would do. So this is how you do ATLS. Um, it concentrates, like I said, on that first hour post-injury, saving lives at immediate risk. You know, if you can open an airway, you can save a life. Uh, in the Vietnam battlefield, research showed that between 9 and 18% of deaths on the battlefield were from exsanguination, from bleeding, that could have been controlled that could, somebody could have been saved had, had aid been there to do the right thing, put on a tourniquet or pressure dressing. So um, one of the doctors, a young doctor who had just been drafted right at the end of his residency, uh, quoted to me during the course, he says, in the Talmud, the purpose of ATLS is whoever saves one life saves the entire world. And, you know, I just felt like uh, when they asked me to go do this, I couldn't say no. And uh, his quote really rang true uh, when we talked about things during and after the course. Uh, when the students finish, they get a certificate of completion. They don't get the standard ATLS certificate because it's not fully accredited, but they leave with something that says they were there and they took it. And you can see all these sponsoring organizations, Harvard Humanitarian, International Medical Corps, Boston Children's, Mass General, uh, Global uh, medicine. These guys, you know, people really put a lot of time, energy, money into getting us there. And let me tell you the logistics of getting 10 people from across the country, uh, across the border during a war and keeping them safe and getting them out again was pretty complicated. Um, and I can't tell you how rewarding it really felt. It was amazing. But I want to digress because while I was there, I talked a little bit earlier about my friend and shipmate, Malcolm Nance. Some of you might have seen him on MSNBC as a contributor before the war started. He's fighting with the International Legion. Um, the International Legion has 25,000 volunteers fighting for Ukraine from over 50, 50 countries. They get background checks and psyche valves. You know, they don't want any Rambos. Uh, he returned home for a week in August to promote his book that he wrote last year. Uh, and had just been published, and he, he wanted to give a talk or two. Uh, the book is fabulous. I can highly recommend it to you. It also scared me, and uh, uh, it's called They Want to Kill Americans. A little disheartening, but it's a tremendous review of what went on 
with Trump and, and all the supporters who are anti-democratic and how they're willing to be armed and promote conspiracies in a good book. Um, and while he was here, he talked at the Commonwealth Club, which I'm going to show you. So he was he's, he's their intelligence officer and an old friend. Uh, and this was just before I was going to Ukraine. So we went out for drinks. We talked for a couple hours. But I want to tell you a little bit of what um, he talked about at the Commonwealth Club and how he got me involved in a little side hustle, as I've said. So he joined early on. Last week in February, he was in Ukraine signing up. You know, they have to join the Ukrainian army. Uh, and we've been in intermittent direct touch when he's in a safe place. So he comes home. I want you to meet him, listen to his discussion. It's very interesting. And the thing, you know, I had in the pre-war had gone to Donetsk and Luhansk with the commander of the Ukrainian Joint Task Force, General Sersky, mm -hmm. who is commanding right at the battlefront that they've held since 2014. We were 70 meters. That's 210 feet away from the Russians. I'm watching the general. And I said this on MSNBC. I said, these guys are going to fight. I can tell by the look in this man's eye. Right. He is ready to kick Russian ass mm -hmm. and enjoy it. And the other commander, the commander of land warfare was General Sersky. You know, guys about five foot five, five foot fives of five foot five inches of I cannot be defeated. No, really. And as I looked at them, I was like, whoa, I think there's something happening here in media that is not being factored. And I said this on one of the MSNBC shows about three or four days before the invasion. And they were like, well, you know, the invasion will be quick. Analysts were coming on. The invasion will be quick. They'll right. lose rather fast. And I said, hey. Let me tell you something. They I were talking about the Ukrainians losing. Right. They the said Ukrainians the Ukrainians, are, he would be in there within two weeks, it would all be over. Right. They, the entire war Kiev. would be over. Yeah. Kiev would be taken in right. 72 hours. And I kept thinking, this is why intelligence field collectors are the smart ones to listen to. We're on the ground. They're going to lose this war. They don't have enough men to win this war. The Russians. You know, yes. Well, and I made you still some, believe that, that the sure, Ukrainians are going to win. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I'm a member of the International Legion. I, you know, I, I am with the forces that are fighting the Russians on the front line on the Eastern Front. They do not want to be uh, the, carrying out any more operations. We Russia definitively, without any question, is going to lose this war. Well, it's not over yet, but boy, he was prescient that Ukraine would not fall. So after I arrived, this is what he did. Um, this is what he looked like out on patrol. He sends me a message. We need IV insertion needles, infusion tubing, and resuscitation fluid. Wow, okay, that's a challenge. Uh, a major offensive is coming and my medic is out of stuff. My medics, I should say, are out of stuff. We need to be able to stabilize our wounded. Uh, he sent me another picture after he came back and went out on a second patrol, says I really need this stuff. Uh, so I ran around with one of our interpreters. We called lots of places. We visited lots of pharmacies. I scoured all kinds of medical supply places. And I came up with a car full of medical supplies, exactly what he wanted. And he sent a courier. Uh, that was a very interesting experience to meet his courier, who then took it to the battlefield and distributed it amongst his medics. As you can see here on the right, his medic is holding up the stuff that I sent him. Uh, and very, very happy to have the gear he needed for life-saving treatment. Um, so that was kind of my little side hustle, kind of an interesting thing. So, you know, I taught during this course, uh, ATLS. I also learned the Ukrainians are highly educated people. They're tech savvy. They're entrepreneurial. The younger generation, they speak, a lot of them speak English. They carry on a normal life in the face of adversity. I think it's amazing. Um, they're highly patriotic. And, you know, those kinds of expressions of patriotism were all over the city where you'd see murals like this. Uh, you'd see signs like this having to do with free the Mariupol defenders. And my all time favorite on the side of one of the cathedrals was a picture of one of the saints holding a javelin missile, anti tank missile uh, on apartment building, excuse me, next near the um, cathedral. I mean, very, very patriotic. So, can Putin. Triumph? Well, you know, the Russian army is pretty big. He's doing a million man call up. Um, I don't know what kind of quality they're going to get or what their training is going to be. Um, they can pulverize the cities. You saw how Mariupol looks. Um, stand by for more deportations. This morning, I heard as many as 
3 million uh, have been deported from the East to Russia and maybe more show trials, you know, Russia will try to terrorize the Ukrainians into submission, but it, it won't work. And his final achievement, well, let's see what Yuval says. The only thing he's accomplishing, he's planting seeds of hatred in the hearts of every, Ukra every Ukrainian being killed. Every day this war continues is more seeds of hatred that may last for generations. The Ukrainians and Russians didn't hate each other before Putin. They're siblings. Now he's making them enemies. And if he continues, this will be his legacy. That is his legacy, indeed. So, you know, you might have seen this picture before. I've, I've always been very proud of American bravery and, and valor, uh, generations of valor. Um, you know, here's, here's a new generation of valor. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky, Jewish guy whose granddad fought the Nazis. Um, he's standing up to a dictator. I don't. I, I think he's amazing. Um, uh, he, he's this generation's Winston Churchill. He's rallied the whole nation. Uh, amazing. And uh, you know, let's let's channel Winston for a second because this is Zelensky. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. That's Zelensky. So one more thing. As you know, I always like to do one more thing in my lecture. Now are we done? No, actually, there's one more thing. The Ukrainians see themselves as a separate nation with a separate history, separate culture, separate language, as we've talked about. They really value education very highly. They're a technologically very astute group. Um, they're now fighting for their homes and homelands. Um, my friend Malcolm Nance says the Russians are fighting so that they can loot, loot and murder and rob and uh, great people. Um, but I want to tell you something about the kids in Ukraine because I, I'm, I'm over a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, I'm going to show you a little group of videos I, I melded together with advice from both students and one of their educators. We are the generation who uh, has to uh, promote it to develop our country after the war. Soldiers now are fighting in the south and east of Ukraine, and we have to fight here. We have to develop our skills. We have to make a future and a history for our country. It's a real crime, a real genocide, and you cannot forget about it. And it's not something that only affects Ukrainians. It's something that will sooner or later affect the whole world. If you don't help us now, you'll be the next. You'll be the next who will be in the war with this evil who has arisen from the ashes of your indecision. So decide now, or you just you will need to fight with this on your own land. I don't think that you want it, really. It's just excruciating to see people dying because of their nationality, because they are Ukrainians. So you just, you don't need that. So help us now. 13 years old. Uh, I wanted to just use a Zoya. My freedom is connected to yours. We will walk again the path to become a prosperous, free nation. If you stand with us. So please, don't watch from the side. Don't wait and see. Stand up with us. Now, stand up for freedom, stand up for democracy, stand up for Ukraine. The kids are amazing. The teacher is amazing, given this TED Talk. Um, one thing I want to introduce you to also is Gary Kasparov's book that came out before the invasion about why the enemies of the free world must be stopped. Winter is coming. I highly recommend it to you. It was a good read. And as we get to the close here, uh, I, I think the bottom line is we must fight authoritarian aggression in Ukraine um, or authoritarians everywhere will be emboldened. You know, next stop Kaliningrad, maybe next stop Taiwan. Um, and we might be fighting for our freedom in the USA before very long. You see what's going on. Um, it's on TV all the time. I want to also remind you of, of Dr. Snyder's words. Great, really good historian. If none of us is prepared to die for freedom, then all of us will die in unfreedom. 
We must be prepared for courageous acts. And if we are passive rather than acting with courage, we will be easy targets. Don't stand on the side. Don't wait for things to happen. Um, get involved is my message. And from my favorite movie. Here it is. The welcome extra fight. This time I know our side will win. All of us need to be in this fight and contribute with whatever ability we have, um, which is why I went to Ukraine. And interestingly enough, I might be going back in about two weeks because they've reached out to me. Um, so thank you for taking this lesson with me today. Uh, I'm going to open the chat room and we'll go into some discussion. And uh, let me see. Is Yugoslavia part of those 75 years? Not exactly. Um, so the referendum uh, that Putin proposes, nobody's going to monitor that. The UN is ineffective. The UN has lost its mojo. Uh, very un unfortunate. Um, who should we be donating to? I'm going to leave that to, to your uh, Ollie uh, staff like Susan Hoffman to recommend some charities. There, there's a lot of really good ones, um, but I'm glad you asked. So donating. Um, I was talking with my kids last night about sponsoring a Ukrainian family in our house because I, I saw something on the news where this guy has sponsored 12 different families until they got, um, you know, able to be relocated in, into the U.S., which is really amazing. Uh, something to think about. And yes, that's Casablanca. Uh, it's not the Scottish flag. This is the naval flag for all stop. So. Um, what can each of us do to help fight Putin? Well, first of all, you want to oppose lies and misinformation everywhere. Anything you can donate to this cause, whether it's money uh, for supplies, whether it's money for refugees, whether it's actual physical help for refugees. I hear we're getting a fair number here in the Bay Area. Uh, and, you know, I would do anything I could for these guys if I can give them some help. So, um, World Central Kitchen, Doctors Without Borders, they're all good. Um, you know, World Central Kitchen actually had a restaurant in Kyiv. Um, so I'll let you guys uh, think about those. Um, this, this has been a very um, painful kind of uh, trip. I have to say, I, I, I don't travel as smoothly as I used to, um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And like I said, they've reached out to me to maybe go back and uh, I'm probably going to accept that offer. Um, one last question, is there an avenue to remove Russia from the UN Security Council? Uh, I've been going over this subject with a friend of mine named Colonel Alex Vindman and a couple of lawyers who do international law, and it's really convoluted. The United Nations Charter doesn't really have a way to get them out, and we wrote it that way. This is our own fault, so that nobody could get us out, I guess. Uh, so we'll see. Anyway, I'm going to thank you all um, for joining me today, and I'm going to turn the meeting back over to our staff, and I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and if you have questions, you know you're welcome to email me. Michael, thank you. Um, it is <laughs> it is difficult to to speak after um, such a weighty um, presentation. We really appreciate. Um, your dedication and commitment of service. And we are delighted that um, Ali members are also interested in what they can do. One of the things that I will suggest um, is a member meetup where we all talk about who is doing what in support of Ukraine. And those member meetups happen on Thursdays at 11 o'clock. We'll find a time. And so the suggestions that people have made here we will um, put that into the conversation. Um, and obviously, your own commitment, Michael, has, is just awe-inspiring. I want to remind people that uh, uh, Dr. Baker's talk will be on YouTube uh, next week. Please share it uh, with friends. I think that this was such a cogent uh, kind of depiction of the history and partly the lies. Um, about Ukraine as a nation. And I think, you know, it'd be so valuable to sort of share that with others. 
Let me also mention that the fall speaker series will continue next Friday with a series that we call America's Unfinished Work. And in this particular um, talk, we will have Dr. Catherine Choi, who is a professor of Asian American and a Asian Diaspora Studies and Comparative Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. She has just completed a book. The title of her talk is Asian American Histories of the United States. We hope you will join us and thank you very much for listening today. And again, Dr. Baker, thank you. Thank you.